Truth Be Told by Daniel K. Byram Narrated by Daniel K. Byram Part 1 Gate Wallace Chapter 1 Day 3285 The room was a mere 10 foot by 6 foot with a single cot, a sink, and a toilet with fluorescent lighting. There was a small table with a chair with a few books and pads of paper laid in a haphazard way on both. The floor was concrete, painted light gray, the walls originally a light yellow, were now dingy and pale. The cot was lumpy, the pillow flat, and the single wool blanket sufficient in the confined space. This had been home for exactly 3,285 days, or as the calendar reminded, nine whole years. The clamor of voices far away or in the next cell was a constant. The routine was as predictable as the meal schedule. The bell sounded at 7 a.m. The doors to all the cells magically opened at 7.30. Exiting to his left to head to the mess hall, he wondered if his shoes were wearing unevenly, as if he could do a tire rotation to make them last longer. Breakfast was over by 8.15 and he would head to the library to work until 12.45. Then he would head back to the mess hall for lunch until 1.30. Then he was directed out into the yard for 90 minutes of fresh air, rain or shine, snow or blow. He would walk the perimeter for 45 minutes. Then he would sit and chat with his friends. They would comment on the current light football or basketball game in progress. Occasionally, they would tell stories about the good old days, the days before their change of address, when they all didn't dress the same. The bell would sound at 3 p.m., and they would shuffle off back to their individual cells where they would be locked down for the shift change. The counts would begin as they did every day. Every cell was filled in C-block because it made it easier to know if someone was missing. The triple-tier construction housed exactly 150 men, 50 cells on each level, 25 on each side. The bars would magically slide back again at 6 p.m., and he would exit to the left, Walk the 100 steps to the stairs, down three flights, turn left again, walk the long haul 99 steps from door to door, and enter the mess hall for dinner. Dinner was over at 6.45, and they were ushered back to their block, where it was free time until 9 p.m. Then they were locked up again until 7.30 the next morning. Evening was the most dangerous time of the day. There were two and a half hours to shower, shave, and socialize. Some preferred to bicker, taunt, and tease, especially with a new guy. The bullies could smell them from a distance as if they were perfumed showgirls or lepers. It would start with a shoulder bump or a discussion over whose chair they were sitting in. Then it would escalate from there. Their best defense was a good offense. The first beating was unavoidable, and postponement was difficult and usually ill-advised. The sooner a new guy struck a blow for his turf, the sooner he would earn some respect, and the sooner he would get some peace. The peace was threefold. Step one was to fight like a raving, ferocious lunatic, causing as much bodily damage to your opponent as possible until the guards pulled you off. The second was a step, a stopover in the infirmary, where your personal damage was patched up. The third was 30 days in solitary confinement, where you were safe from everyone else. On this night, all was calm for two very good reasons. Tomorrow was visiting day and parole board day. Tomorrow, family and friends would come to visit face to face for one whole hour. They could bring a few gifts or a new book to read, school class photos, and the latest news from the outside world. However, no one in solitary confinement was afforded visitors, thus the keeping of the peace. The parole board was rumored to be coming with a mandate to release a fair number of them back to the world. Lights out came promptly at 10.45, another bad time for a prisoner, the calendar reminding him that another day had ticked off his life. He stripped out of his clothes and hung them on a hook. He slid his shoes to the side, peeled off the white cotton socks, and slung them over the institutional black plastic chair. He wore only his shorts now as he sat on his bunk. Worldly possessions had never been important to him and it was a good thing because he owned very little. He owned two pair of pants, two t-shirts, two long sleeve button up the front collared shirts, four pair of socks, and four pair of boxer briefs. 
He had a storage locker off C block where he had a fleece, a winter jacket, gloves, a hat, winter boots, and long underwear. He didn't own a comb, a razor, or scissors, nail clippers, or any other personal grooming gear. He was issued shampoo, soap, shaving cream, and razors at the dispensary. He had to check them in and out when he showered with strict guidelines of no more than 30 minutes for use. He could keep his toothbrush and toothpaste, which he purchased from the store. He owned a few sets of playing cards and a chess set, just like all the other 149 men in his block. He lay down on his bunk as the light shut off in the dark again. His mind wandered back into history. His lawyer had stopped calling in year two because his case was not going to win an appeal. His friends stopped coming to visit in year one. His mother died in year five, and his wife gave up on him in year four. His best friend was paroled in year six, wrote one letter, and never wrote again. The warden was stabbed in year seven during a very exciting 72-hour prison riot, one where he simply stayed in his cell and participated in the forced three-day fast, drinking from the sink and avoiding the melee. Three years, then six years, he was denied parole. Tomorrow, year nine, he had another chance at saying the right things in the right way with the right vocal intonation. Many said, try not to sound eager or aggressive. Others said, give it to them straight, be honest, be yourself, because that's your best chance of getting out of here. He felt strangely detached from the whole process. He had not seen the outside world for more than 3,000 days, and what did he have out there to look forward to anyway? Nothing. He had no friends, no job, no wife, and no kids. The one bright spot in his life was his sister, who he knew would be in the visiting room tomorrow. She had never, not once, missed the monthly visit. She had driven in snowstorms, heat waves, and once when she was in the beginning stages of labor. Her belly was domed as if she was a basketball smuggler, and he palmed her stomach, feeling the little life moving and squirming. Later, he let his fellow inmates believe she was his girl, just so he could feel needed or wanted. His wife never shattered the doors of the prison, not even to say goodbye. He got that information in a letter a week after he was in possession of the divorce papers. He rolled to his side, pulled back his mattress, pulled out a worn brown envelope. He flipped to his back and held up the pictures. The dim light from the common area was enough since his mind had, ar had every detail memorized. The family photo with his mother and sister right before all of this happened. The next one was the latest of her three children and then one of her whole family. Lastly, a picture of someone he had never officially met. Her name was written on the back in blue ink with a loopy writing clearly written by a woman's hand. He unfolded the paper with eight equally creased, almost falling apart sides. He read the letter again. Although he had committed it to memory long ago, it gave him comfort. A tear rolled down his cheek. So far, this young woman had taken almost a quarter of his life. Nine years he had spent playing his mental recorder repeatedly. What could he have done differently? Why did it have to be him in the first place? He wasn't sorry for his actions nor did he feel shame of what he had done. Even now, he couldn't think of one thing he could do differently. The parole board asked in year three if he was sorry for his actions. He said no. Parole denied. In year six, they asked him if he was sorry for his victims, and he said no. Parole denied. Now, tomorrow, year nine, and they were going to ask him a version of the same questions, and he had no idea what he was going to say. He wanted to pontificate on the circumstances that he was also a victim of said circumstances. He was not a villain. He did not set out to hurt anyone. In fact, he'd actually set out on that day to help people. He wanted to scream at the top of his lungs. It was infuriating how twisted the world had become and how justice had died along with their morality. Cell Block C was known as the killer wing. There were no rapists here, no thieves, no official drug dealers, and no white-collar accountant types serving time on tax evasion. Certainly many were guilty of other crimes, but they were here for only one. All 150 men between the ages of 18 and 79 were murderers, according to the U.S. Department of Justice. The number of victims rumored to be well over the number of perpetrators. The oldest man in cell block C lived in suite one, as they mockingly referred to each cell. It was located on the first floor near the guard station. He had killed 27 people over three days in a drug deal gone belly up. The story had, gone over, had grown over the years, 
but the basic facts are simple. He showed up to a drug deal where there wasn't any money, and they attempted to relieve him of his current drug supply. Once the shooting started, he didn't stop until he had put a serious fissure in the entire drug syndicate in the Midwest. The rampage stretched over three states and ended with him turning himself into the authorities in Charlevoix, Michigan. He avoided the death penalty by ratting out other big players. It could even be argued that he had done such community service that his sentence should be commuted to time served. The youngest killer was just 18, just one victim, a rival suitor for the affections of his now ex-girlfriend. He kissed his sister, her three babies, and put the photos away back under his mattress. His mind was racing with a mix of excitement, anticipation, and fear. He no longer had fear of the prison or his current neighbors. No one here knew his story, and he wasn't talking. It was rumored he had killed as many as 15 or 20, and of course maybe only one. No one messed with him, so he could make it, as, make it a few more years. He did, however, fear the outside world. What if he was paroled, and then what? It was probably easier now just to stay put. At least here he knew what to expect. All his decisions were made for him. Clearly, the last decisions he made as a free man landed him here. A good argument for staying. His sister would be here tomorrow to make a statement to the parole board, as would his victim's family. He couldn't tell if they hated him or just hated coming to a prison and taking time out of their lives. Three years ago, they read a statement about missing their family member and how they were still suffering the trauma of it all. The parole board room was located in the main office building on the sprawling North Michigan campus of Gate Wallace Penitentiary. In order to appear at the hearing, Stephen Lolio was handcuffed, including leg irons, with connecting waist chains. They were not taking any chances of an escape as they transported him out of the maximum security wing through general population and across the large parking area to the main office complex. The van stopped at the side entrance and he was escorted into the building to the holding room for potential parolees. When his name was finally called, he shuffled into the room where a few dozen people sat waiting for a turn to defend or condemn a potential parolee. Stephen felt like a death row inmate waiting to be executed. He sat down in the chair facing the panel of expert guessers. The government always thought they knew best being able to pick the winners and losers. The smartly dressed professionals were shuffling papers and organizing their thoughts. His judge and jury consisted of one woman and two men, and he quickly noticed her bare legs under the table. Prison was a harsh place, and just the sight of her feminine form made his mind wander to all the places he shouldn't go. Okay, good morning. I'm Robert Vanderpolk, the oldest man said. I am the chairman of the parole board here today, and to my right is Melissa Fastica, and on my left, Ernest Darling. We are here to meet with Stephen Lolio. Are you Stephen? Yes, I am. Fine, good, Vanderpolk said as he looked at his sheet of paper. Stephen, according to my notes, this is your third parole hearing. You have been in Gate Wallace for nine years, is that correct? Yes, sir. You have a good reputation here, and we are currently working in the library, is that correct? Was that a question? He just nodded his head, trying to look sincere. Tell us all here today why you think you would be successful if you were granted parole, Vanderpolk said. Stephen thought for a few moments. Mr. Vanderpolk, I have served nine years here, and I am currently in good standing with the guards and prisoners alike. I stay out of trouble, do my work, and just try to make it another day. I'm not a threat to anyone here, and I'm confident I would not be a threat to anyone out there. He used his head to point and sway in the direction of the highway. If we granted you parole, do you think you, could, you would commit any other crimes? Stupid questions are now going to be asked and answered. No, I would not. The one with the leg shoved a piece of paper across to Vanderpolk, and he read it silently. Then he looked at her and then back at his notes. Uh, Mr. Lolio. Crap, crap, crap. I'm screwed calling me Mr. Lolio is a sure loser. Suddenly he noticed the room was silent. Oh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? Certainly, Mr. Lolio. Can you tell us how you feel about what you, you have done? Here we go. That's better. A good, solace, ambiguous question. I have spent nine years thinking about my actions on that day. I feel bad that people got hurt, even though I did not hurt them. And I hope something like this never happens again. I have apologized to the family, but I offer that apology again. I am truly sorry for the pain I have caused the Cardell family and truly wish I could change the events on that day so their father and Mrs. Cardell's husband had not died. 
He noticed Legs didn't seem impressed. Mr. Lolio, do you have anyone here who can speak on your behalf? The room was silent as he slid around, scanning the bored faces of the people, but none of them looked familiar, and his sister wasn't there. He was suddenly deflated. Sir, my sister was supposed to be here today. She may be running late. It's a long drive. Okay, Mr. Lolio, I will read for the record a letter sent to us specifically for this hearing. Then he proceeded with the standard victim's letter, asking for sympathy and assurance of peace of mind that leaving Stephen Lolio behind bars would bring. Oh, the heartache. He couldn't care less. He was a victim, too, but no one wanted to hear about it anymore. I have a question, Legs said. Certainly, Miss Fastica, proceed, Verna Polk said, as if she were about to enlighten the room with wisdom. Mr. Lolio, do you have remorse over the death of Dr. Alan Cardell, or are you just sorry you're in prison? Nice. Now we're in the stupid questions hardcore. Of course, I am remorseful. I wish he wasn't dead because he didn't deserve to die. That's not completely true, but for my purposes here today, that's the answer. I am sorry his family has suffered, but not that they lost their income. My father and mother have both passed away, so I understand a little bit about the sadness of losing a parent. Just then the door opened and everyone looked to see a woman with three children in tow trying to quietly slip into a row. Stephen turned to look, grateful his sister was present, and with all three prodigy. Then Miss Fastica asked another question. Why did you do it? Damn, that's the hardest one to dodge because I didn't do it. I have no good answer for that, he hesitated, because there is no good answer. What can I say? It was wrong, and I will always have to live with that. Yes, you will, but you're still living, aren't you? Legs said with disdain. Excuse me, a woman's voice said from the back. Yes, ma'am. I'm Gretchen Lolio Dillmaker, Stephen's sister. Can I make a statement to the board? Certainly. Step up here to the podium, Vanderpolk said. Gretchen made her way to the podium, a sweet waft of perfume catching Stephen's nose as he looked up and smiled at her. She smiled back. Gretchen was pretty and tall, with a few well-hidden extra pounds. She was dressed in black slacks and a multicolored conservative blouse with earrings and a gold chain necklace. Good morning, my name is Gretchen Lolio Dillmaker. I am the younger sister of Stephen. He is the only family I have left on the earth. I am not alone. I have three great kids and a wonderful husband. We are not poor, we are not rich, and we are content in all that God gives us. I come here today not to plead or beg for Stephen's release, but to speak on his behalf. Nine years ago, he was found guilty of second-degree murder of Dr. Alan Cardell. It is a sad story with a sad ending because a man lost his life, a wife lost her husband, and children lost their father. Until that day, Stephen had never been arrested and had never been in any trouble with anyone. The circumstances which led to his arrest and subsequent conviction were just that, circumstantial. Was Stephen there? Yes. But he did not do this terrible thing. He could not, nor would not, do such a thing. I know what you think, what you're thinking, and I would think it too. I am his little sister, who thinks he hung the moon and he can do no wrong. Well, I do think that, because I watched him for the first 25 years of my life. I watched him help people, care for people, give to people, go out of his way for people. He doesn't have a violent bone in his body. She paused to compose her thoughts and swallow her emotions. After he was convicted, I have come here every month for the last nine years because I know in the deepest part of my heart that my brother is innocent. If what I say is true, then he is also a victim. He lost his wife because of her grief and the shame was just too much for her. Our mother died four years ago and my brother wasn't there to say goodbye. My children are growing up without their only uncle on my side, and they are missing out on a relationship with one of the best people I know. In addition, if I am right, he has served 3,286 days in Gate Wallace Penitentiary for a crime he didn't commit. I conclude with this. All these things are forgiven already. I am only asking that you give Stephen Lolio back his life and back to his family, and let him live out his days in peace. This board here today has the power to make a difference in Stephen's life. Thank you. Gretchen returned to her seat next to her three children as the board checked over their notes. Vanderpolk spoke. Thank you, Mrs. Dillmaker. We appreciate your statement. We will have our decision in a few weeks.